So uh, Livy, Geo Week 2022. Yes, thank you so much for letting me have this space and being able to chat to you guys because I need a more creative approach to a very scientific project. Um, and I thought who best to speak to than the most creative people I know, <laughs> which you all congregate on this group. Um, so I'll give myself a bit of a background information for people that don't know me. Uh, I'm the curatorial assistant at Tully House. I have a geology degree and I work in the geology department. Um, and I wanted to give like a little time travel view of how I see the geology of Cumbria, give you a bit of context and then hopefully get your opinions on what you think of the geology, the kinds of people that you would associate with that side so that we can turn steam into, well, turn STEM into steam. Because I know that that's something that everyone here has really been pushing for. And I really want to push this forward. And I think geology is the best way to go with it. Um, so I'll uh, show you my PowerPoint. And Lovely. See. I'll just start sharing that for you now. And just let me know when you want to uh, move the slides up. Thanks. <laughs> So if you want to go to the next slide, I always like a nice introduction. So Cumbria is split up into several different sections that cross several different time periods. The oldest time period is the Ordovician, and we had a lot of volcanic eruptions then. Um, it was between two continental plates that were colliding together slowly but surely, creating a more shallower sea. Um, and where the red parts are, the Ordovician, which is 488 million years ago, um, that's the oldest part of Cumbria. And then you have the Silurian, which again, more volcanics, um, and the same with the Devonian. All of that central area, you can just, it's basically a lot of volcanic um, eruptions were happening at that time. We then, um, transition slowly into the Carboniferous, which is Neil's favorite time period because it's filled with coal and limestone. And it's one of the reasons why we have so many mines across Whitehaven and Workington because that's where all the coal came from, from all the swamps um, that got squashed into the. Sorry. Have you seen the ferns that have been pressed into the rock. That's the kinds of things that we would expect to be seeing there. Um, we then had the Permian and the Jurassic, which was a desert. And you can actually see remnants of sand dunes on Tully House's wall, if you're looking around. But then we have a massive time period that's just scraped off by the glaciers um, during the Quaternary period. Um, and then we're kind of left with this beautiful rock pattern. And if you click the next slide, well, move across. Um, you know, to kind of give you an idea of what kind of environments Cumbria was subjected to over the last 500 million years. Um, then one more. And that's the full um geological map and i personally think the geological map is a really beautiful thing but re but quite complicated which is why i've gone for the simplified to the <laughs> more complex so that you can then get your eye in and get the very specific stories which was one of the reasons that i wanted to do geo week and why tully house has wanted to get this going across the county because we have got a massive story to tell and we've got so many different museums in order to be able to tell the specific area stories and the different environments that were affected. So the first objective is that we wanna make Cumbrian geology far more accessible because at the moment it's very complicated, but really interesting. We wanna reconnect people with the environment and show that actually Cumbria has not been this static environment. It has changed over time for, like I was saying from being in the middle of the ocean to a desert, swamps, all sorts, and it could happen again, especially with the way that climate change is going. 
we have we have the potential for that to happen again. Um, and then I also want to give people opportunities to be able to get involved with Cumbrian geology and highlight the work that geoconservation are doing, that the Cumbrian Geological Society are doing, because they are filled with such fantastic local knowledge. And I think that this would be a fantastic platform to allow them to speak and allow them to share their stories. Uh, if you go on to the next slide. Thank you. Um, here's some like technical drawings that I've done as part of my degree. Um, we have the mineral cross section. I love cross sections because it looks a bit like a kaleidoscope. Um, and I think that that is fantastic inspiration for art. I, I think that you could make it into a pattern within itself. Being able to walk across the ground and see the geology and time travel, I, I absolutely love it. Um, but I've gone from the technical, which is this, and then if we go on to the next slide, to the more artsy to try and bridge that gap. Um, I really like mixed media work. It's one of my favorite things to do. I've been practicing with watercolor, but I think that looking at maps, looking at the texture of rocks, looking at um, how the minerals are composed, we can bring the science and art together to make a really beautiful story that people actually want to connect to. So if we go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, I would really appreciate getting your opinions on how you see the landscape, how you see geology, any interesting stories that um, you've come across that you think the rest of the public would like to hear about. If you click on the link that will be ah, If you click on the link, you should be able to uh, put words, key phrases, people. Um, Stefan is going to set up a breakout room so people can discuss and add more information. I think that's fine. Um, but yeah, if you've got any questions, please feel free to ask them and allow the discussion to go ahead. Thank you. Let's have a few questions before we take up Libby's invitation to go into four breakout rooms, Amy, um, which is a chance to respond to what she's inviting us to consider. But uh, questions for Libby on what she's just been saying. If you raise a virtual hand, use your, um, oh, oh, Helen, I can see you waving straight away. Helen, what, what would you like to ask? I think you're muted, Helen, sorry. I, I wasn't clear what the menti.com thing is. Could you just elaborate on that? Libby? Menti is a survey um, that I've created to collect all of the keywords, phrases, stories um, that you would want to share with me um, that hopefully we can add to the project and bring into Geo Week 2022. So if you click on the link, you'll see a page will come up and you'll be able to add in some words or phrases. Okay, right. Um, Fliss and Bridget, Fliss has a question. Uh, yeah, just um, during the week in 2022, are you going to be sort of taking over Tully House with all kinds of geological stuff? What, uh, as, is it going to be kind of building up to an exhibition or events or what's that going to look like? The plan is um, events and tours. We've got um, Geocon, who are, Geoconservation, sorry, who are absolutely special. They're, more specialized in Cumbrian geology than I've been. They've been doing it for before I was born. I'm catching <laughs> up. Um, <laughs> so um, at the moment we're building a project so that we know exactly what events, what talks, what exhibitions to go on, but with the premise that it's more of a creative approach, more of a STEAM approach rather than mm -hmm. a STEM approach. Um, but I will make sure that um, CACN finds out about all the events and you guys can <laughs> sign up and join, don't worry. <laughs> it's, it sounds fantastic. Brilliant. Thank Bridget, you. Bridget, you had a question. Thank you, Fliss. Bridget. 
Yeah, thanks. Um, Livy, do you have an idea of what time of year the Geo Week will be? It will be May, so it's May. a bit of a way off, yeah, but it, I'm hoping to get several different museums and organisations, so I've got to give them some time to, <laughs> to plan, and if they're wanting like little grand projects, then I'm going to help them with that, but for now, it's research, find out if people are interested, what kind of people and what kind of information people want to know more about. Yeah, no, I was just thinking, um, you know, if you've already sort of said that you're planning events. So I was thinking if, if um, you know, people wanted to lead walks or do sort of things outside, then yeah. That's, <laughs> and also, would you make your email address available? So we might Absolutely. contact you. Um, that, that'd, be really, that'd be really great. Thank you. And, and a question from Petra, I think. Yes, hello there. Thank you, Livy. Um, yeah, I'm, I was just uh, interested to know because uh, the geology in, in Copeland and Ellerdale is, is, is quite um, um, in, in the news at the moment because of the uh, drive by radioactive waste management uh, to, to site a deep geological facility for uh, nuclear waste. And I've been to some of their road shows and they have a very cool uh, map, interactive map of the geology there. So I was just uh, wondering whether, you know, politically you're, you're uh, at all planning to engage with um, the interest in geology that that is at the forefront uh, there at the moment, because um, it's quite uh, prominent, of course. It is oh. prominent and it is something that I've been trying to look into. Um, however, um, I think the nuclear power waste facility has rebranded nuclear waste disposal as geological disposal. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure is the honest answer. I am still looking into it. It's a very much an ethical gray area and I, I need some more time to process all the information before going into that, but they do have really nice graphics, I agree. <laughs> Thank you, Libby. And Sue, I believe you've got a question. Hi, I was just going to ask you, Libby, if you're in con contact with uh, the mining people of, around the county, Florence Mine and all the arts there, and also the mining heritage of Whitehaven. Nenthead Mines, I don't know what's happening these days, the lead mining up at um, Alston Way. It used to have an open facility there. I don't think you can visit anymore. But there's such a lot around. The Colbeck Fells, the mining there in, in years gone by, in Elizabethan times, it was said that Colbeck Fells were worth all England else because there was gold and silver and all sorts of minerals. So are you looking at the mining heritage as well? I think mining is so important because most, oh, I'm going to put it, most people that have got Cumbrian ancestry will have a relative that has something to do with the mines, whether it's owning or having been down. And I think it's really important to tell those stories. Um, I have spoken to Florence Mine uh, because I think that they've got, they, um, they make pigments out of ores. And I think that that's such a beautiful approach to steam, um, bringing the rocks and the paint together. Um, there are a few other places that I've also spoken to, um, but at the moment it's all gauging interest and then it's the next step. But all the information that you guys could give me about like what you're interested in, what things you want to see, um, and mining, I'm putting that down as a star. <laughs> Thank you for that, Sue. Um, uh, I think it will really help them then create their events and their tours so it's catered more to people that are going to actively get involved in Geo Week. So thank you for that, Steve. Uh, question from Robin Harriet. Uh, it's from Rob, probably, uh, although Harriet asked the same thing. We've opened the Mentimeter um, poll up, uh, maybe. Oh. Now, are we supposed to answer those questions as if we weren't talking to you now? Is it is it for you to sort of prove how low geology might be on the public's awareness, or or what? You know, the, you know, the yeah. What do you want to do with the answers? You, yeah. How do you want us to put the answers down? If you know what I mean, without skewing what we say. Um, 
I just want your honest opinions because all of you guys are fantastic people. Um, and I'm planning on using this uh, when I have my first partnership meeting with the people that have shown interest in this project so that I can say, look, we've got interest and in this is the kind of direction that we're gonna go on based on the survey results that we've gotten from this group. Okay, so the fact that it doesn't mention geology or rocks at all is, is not a, a problem, obviously, as far as you're concerned. You, I know you've probably thought long and hard about this. I, I don't want to skew geology because geology's got... The name geology sometimes can be quite scary for people, which is why landscapes. But if geology isn't a scary word, put geology down. <laughs> I love geology, so I know that I am 100% biased. I'll put my hands up. You're allowed to be. It's your job. <laughs> Thank you. So Libby, um, you were quite keen that we have an opportunity to discuss some of these ideas and come back with some first impulses creatively. Um, anything mm. you want to say to people before we invite them into some breakout rooms to have a think about these ideas? What would you like us to consider? Um, anything. Be as abstract as you want. I, I have been trying to find connections between Wordsworth and geology and I was reading about how he was describing the green stone. And my mind was like, ah, oh, green stone, metamorphism. Uh, that's proof that, <laughs> that it was recognized then. So if you can think of any ways that you can connect geology and arts, um, any, anything that might not have been considered before or people that you've come across who you're like, actually, that's an interesting person, but I haven't seen anything about them in the news or generally known. Um, we love people's stories, they're great. <laughs> but you. mining as well, like, that would be fantastic, thank you. The chat as ever is, is, is ablaze with ideas and responses already, but this is a fantastic way for us to uh, build on those ideas. So we'll just have just a short 10 minutes in four breakout rooms for you to share these ideas amongst yourselves. And then if, if someone from each group can take the responsibility just to feed back concisely what that group has been discussing when we all come back, that'll be really helpful. Wow, well, our room was on, on fire. I hope yours were as well. Um, uh, so um, I'll, I'll just pick someone at random. Fliss, the, the, the group you were in, I, I don't know if you were the person that might want to speak for that group or if someone else. Uh, we, we, we didn't, we forgot to nominate anyone, but I did take some notes in case. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, there was loads and loads. Um, Talking about to start off with layers, the layeredness of things, and and how that's a you know a fruitful concept. Um, um, that geology is so physical and like lends itself to an artistic um, connection. Um, links to cultural history. Um, there was a conversation about all the mining communities and industrial aspects of. Um, Cumbria, as, as contrasted with the kind of beautiful landscapiness, um, slate mines, lead mines, um, red pigment, uh, Hon uh, Honister, Florence, Nent Head. Um, um, there was a discussion about uh, musical events taking place uh, underground uh, in Honister, uh, spa boxes, which I've never heard of, uh, which apparently miners made uh, in the past. Um, somebody suggested we could make modern ones, which were boxes co containing crystals. And apparently there is one at Tully House. Um, graphite, uh, um, graphite mine drawing, obviously. Um, international connections of the history. I'd never heard about this, but apparently German miners came over in the Tudor period to be the, the first miners because they were ahead of the game. Um, and they're apparently the, possibly the source of the Cumberland sausage. So culinary connections uh, that's actually true that all of that is true I've um I... that, that, that's amazing um, yeah. and the, the, my, my favorite idea that I had was uh, that we should be making going underground in either a mine or a cave with some um red pigment from Florence to do some 21st century cave art oh I, along I'm... with the storyteller um which was also mentioned so did I forget anything <laughs> Fantastic. Um, Nick, Nick Greenall, I, I don't know which group you were in, whether whether you might like to be able to speak for that group or you've nominated someone else. You're muted at the moment, Nick. Just oh, I, I took the notes for Nick's group. Alex has taken some oh, notes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'll let, uh, I'll let her uh, read yeah. them. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> 
Um, so we talked about a lot of things, um, some of which you've touched on, Fliss. Um, the idea of traveling rocks and rocks that turn up in unusual places um, and how, yeah, how rocks meet in strange places and walking through the landscape as a way of taking workshops, using visual art as under for understanding rock, but bringing a geologist on as well. Um, yes, music underground. Um, Nick talked about digital cave painting as well, um, which is a quite fun idea. Um, Keswick's musical stones could be taken around and then used in different places. Um, so yeah, cave events. Oh yeah, and cricket underground or other sports are available. Um, stone circles and looking at how they fit in in terms of geology and people's interest. Um, somebody mentioned the idea of how the Eden Valley was once a desert and is now fertile and what can we do with that? Um, there are a lot of writers who are really inspired by geology um, getting definitely into the rocks, uh, a lot of poetry there. So there's a huge amount of potential. Uh, we talked about soil. So soil is related to rock as well as climate change. Um, the way NASA understands soil being on the red list and what can we do about our meeting points and then it can come back to pigments. Um, geology is messages for the future, not just looking, looking back. Dry stone walling and then also sculptures, which is seems fairly obvious, but um, the idea of the different mines and quarries, the slate mines like Burlington, have you got any connections with them? Would you like to link up with them to expand the network um, in terms of either funding or messaging? So I, I had a, I'm going to drop in my thought, which is a mini, um, you know, might be a source of funding, but thinking about uh, Kendall Mountain Festival, oh, yeah. mountains are all made of rock. You know, how you, how you broaden that conversation beyond uh, into different spheres that are slightly left field. Wonderful, thank you so much. Thank you, I'm just scribbling these down. <laughs> Libby's pen is, is smoking uh, much, and, yeah. <laughs> and her email address is in the chat for, for follow-up, thank you very much. Andrew Deakin, um, were you in a separate group, a, a group that hasn't been? I, I was and, and George kindly nominated himself to uh, uh, speak on our behalf. So. George, welcome. Yeah. yeah, hello, no, 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 well I thought somebody, somebody had to, um, I'll try and um, what we found is after a couple of introductions about how exciting geology uh, is, etc., we sort of got down to nitty gritty um, and realised that there's such importance, not just from learning about the deep past um, and the time uh, gone, gone past, but also what we're doing now and what we need to not just get lost maybe in the romanticism of uh, everything. And uh, there's some very, very important things going on there we mention politics and there we mention um you know the, the, you know certain aspects of industry that, that are going on um and decisions being made and how important it is that um we um get to make get some sort of balance we also spoke about the arts um and uh, a couple of members on the on the call were uh, from Lakeland Arts and it's quite exciting to hear what is happening really with um, pe um, people and get trying to engage um, people with the, the landscape and, 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 and the rocks uh, and geology itself. So there's definitely an interest in it and it's de there's definitely some sort of um, you know um, unknown about geology as well so that seemed to come through from the way people were talking and um, I think it's 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 opening up a whole Livy this is hoping opening up a whole can of worms this really in terms of feelings and passions and uh, um, um, you know awareness of the past um, but also I think the, the main one main message from our little group was uh, I think that we need to have our eye on the present and the future uh, as to what our attitudes are. We need to learn from the past, obviously, but we need, also need to be very wary about what is happening at the moment. Is that about right, Andrew? Yeah, I mean, you, 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 we, we talked about deep time as well and the fact that geology allows us to think in much longer um, time spans, and that's an incredibly mm. useful thing for us all, all to do. Um, where, and we tend to think in very short term um, time spans, which is, is sort of fun and reasonable, and it allows us to survive. However, um, the, the the deep time of geology is a really useful thing. The late, this, the late district won't be here in however many million years, um, and it's worth thinking about that. 
And, and on the terribly short time span that is the CAC and Friday Zoom, um, we have to go straight to Livy. Could you just give the headlines of, of, of what was a very stimulating group for us? Uh, well, thank you so much, everyone. Um, it's really good to get the perspective of what is known and what needs to be known. Um, I think the highlights were we want to know the past, linking the past to the present and what it's going to be like in the future. Um, mining, spa boxes and international connection with Cumbrian geology, how to map it. Um, I love the ideas of the storytelling and the underground music. I feel like those are really good, strong ideas and I'm going to suggest them to the other um, participants. And um, uh, the other ones were bouldering stone circles and connecting culture more to um, geology. So thank you very much. That was as, I did it as quickly as I possibly could. <laughs> thank you. Thank you again. Um, and I'll send you, I'll send out the results on the Facebook group so you can see everything. But thanks again for, for joining Fantastic. me. Fantastic. I think that is one of the fullest chats we've had on these meetings. It's just enormously, it's good. And it's, there's more coming. So you must save that at the end, Livy. Thank you so much. And that was a, a very stimulating session for us. Um, Let's move on to um, to Lee. Lee, welcome. You're going to talk to us about the um, Borderlines Book Festival. I, I am. Uh, Tom had told me to prepare 10 minutes worth of chat for you, but I can see that the time is short, so I'll try you to- do have, You do have 10 minutes. Oh, okay. Well, I'll do my, I'll do my best. Um, I am, in fact, at another book festival. I'm in Wigtown in Scotland, which is um, a festival that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, and I've been chairing here for many years, <laughs> but I'm also chairing 11 events here. So please apologize the fact that I'm working from notes right now. <laughs> and I think we'll put up some images from uh, the festival website so you don't have to watch me read to you. Um, so back in, in 2016, I visited uh, Borderlines Carlisle as a chairperson. I was a stand-in for uh, someone and I discovered a place I'd never been to, a really charming historical city with a vibrant festival scene. And as you can probably guess, people who are enthusiastic about books and the people and creators are my kind of people. Um, so when I had the chance to um, join the team, I was way overexcited. Who the hell am I? Well, you can hear that I'm an American, born and raised in New York in the suburbs of New York City. I moved to Scotland almost 24 years ago. Um, but I learned to read many, many, many years longer ago than that. My father taught me to read by helping me write a book. And it's very safe to say that my love affair with words has been the longest and most satisfying relationship of my entire life. I have worked in trade publishing in New York and in the media on both sides of the pond. I've written for magazines, newspapers, I've edited, I've always done the lifestyle features and arts things. Um, I chair for festivals. I helped mentor uh, prospective new chair people who wanted to get into the business. I wrote a massive report for Creative Scotland last year about the changing digital landscape for book festivals and what that might mean for us all going forward. And of course, for five years, I programmed Aberdeen's Granite Noir Book Festival, taking it, I was part of a much bigger team, but we brought it from nothing didn't exist to a real highlight of the city's cultural calendar. I should probably pop in that I live in Edinburgh. Um, the chance to program across a wide range of genres really appeals to me because of course I do read rather voraciously. <laughs> um, for me, a book festival performs multiple functions. It's an agora for ideas. It's a place where art meets commerce. It's a party. It's a party where writers get to meet each other, where writers get to make, meet the people that make their careers possible, their readers. Um, and it's a place where people in the audience who might think they have nothing in common often find they have overlapping interests, whether it's a political awakening or just the shared love of a great author that they both enjoy reading. So what have I programmed for 2021? Uh, I'll start with things that have a bit of local interest. Um, I'm not going in date order. We've got Richard Atkinson coming. Uh, he's gonna be talking about his really highly praised book, Mr. Atkinson's Rum Contract. And it is a story of his Cumbrian ancestors 
who were a well-to-do family whose wealth came at the terrible cost via the labor of enslaved Africans. Um, it began, this project for him began as a personal trawl through his family history, but he wound up confronting a really challenging truth. And what he said is, he hopes that by telling the unvarnished truth about them, I would be able to shine a light on a dark episode of history and show the degree to which slavery was woven into Georgian society. Um, it's one rave reviews, <clears throat> excuse me, and draws on private family correspondence to piece together this really disturbing story. And although Richard is a publisher based in London, he swears that he has great affection for his Northwestern roots. Um, we've got the respected journalist and businessman Stan Abbott coming. He's going to give an illustrated talk about his latest work called Walking the Line, Exploring Settle and Carlisle Country. And uh, this is one for the train enthusiasts in the audience. Um, it's his love letter to the most picturesque line built by the Midland Railway Company in the 1870s to connect its English network with Scotland. Um, and the whole area is a conservation area now and Stan's done his homework and he's gonna talk people through, he's giving a, an illustrated talk. So he'll talk to people through the architecture and the historic remains and he's unearthed stories and traditions and legends. So I think that's going to be a special hour. They're all going to be special hours. We are also uh, celebrating the anniversary of the woman who saw those daffodils first because this is the 250th anniversary of the birth of Dorothy Wordsworth. Um, and what it's going to be, it's, this is the one event, we've got one participant beaming in digitally and one participant in the room with the audience. Um, Dorothy's work is acknowledged as wonderful, but she's nevertheless always overshadowed by her brother, William. So we're going to get to hear Dorothy's work read out. We're going to get to hear work that's been inspired by Dorothy's writing. And you're going to get a sneak preview of Polly Atkins' new book out at the end of November with Saraband Publishing, which talks about Dorothy, but especially about the final years of her life and how she coped with debilitating illness. We've got festival favorite Hannah Jackson coming back with us, the Red Shepherdess. And I think we really need her this year because she's gonna be talking about how she stays inspired and optimistic um, in life on the farm. We've got uh, in a late breaking addition to the uh, program, we've got Roger Bolton who is doing some chairing for us, but is going to also give a little talk about his memoir um, about growing up locally. Um, I'm going to sit down in conversation with Grace Dent and we're going to talk all things food and family. I'm also hoping I'll get her to dish a little about uh, behind the scenes at MasterChef. And I'm dying to ask her about her amazing new podcast, Comfort Eating, um, which has become an absolute fixture in my listening calendar. And if you haven't, if you haven't listened to that, pop onto the Guardian website. It's, it's amazing. We've also got uh, Jim Crumley, who's one of Scotland's most prolific and awarded nature writers, but his new book, Lakeland Wild, is um, all about the Lake District. And his premise is that anyone who says the Lake District has lost its wildness is wrong. Um, so he'll argue for a new way of seeing and writing about the landscape and talk about his exploration of all the out of the way places he's found, some of which he says are not even on the map. Um, and another festival favorite, Caitlin Davies, is coming back. Um, she's, her newest work of social history is about female criminals. It's called Queens of the Underworld. Um, and it's basically about these really outrageous and inventive female criminals who should really should have been as popular and famous and infamous as the Craze and Dick Turpin and all the sorts of people we tell legends about, um, but who've been overshadowed by the men. Uh, she's chosen not to write about any killers. So we've got instead people like Emily Lawrence, who was a diamond thief in the 1860s. Um, we've, and we've got someone like um, Zoe Progo, who I've never heard of, but she was apparently Britain's number one female burglar of the swinging 60s. Um, so speaking of crime, if crime fiction is your passion, we do have a panel featuring two acclaimed authors who are also locally based. 
That'll be M.W. Craven, who I'm sure many of you know, and Claire Askew, um, talking about the hows and the whys and the whodunits and everything that goes into crafting a mystery novel. And in addition, across the weekend, Claire is going to run some workshops. Claire is an award-winning poet as well. Um, she's not giving any poetry workshops, but she will be doing one workshop about what happens if you have plotted yourself into a corner. You've, you've written yourself into a corner. How do you get out of your corner um, it's for any genre? And she'll also be talking about um, avoiding the crime fiction cliches that many beginners fall into so that you don't necessarily automatically write a divorced, um, you know, drug addicted or whatever um, troubled uh, detective because we have quite a few of those already. <laughs> um, we've also got Alan Johnson coming, uh, not as a memoirist this time, but he's coming as a debut novelist of all things. Um, you may have seen that he's written a thriller called The Last Train to Gypsy Hill. Now he will be in conversation with Roger Bolton, so I'm really anticipating a delightful hour filled with great stories because I mean, Alan's got more, more than enough to spare. Um, it is not all crime fiction, however. We've got best-selling novelist Paula Hawkins um, and Ruth Jones, that Ruth Jones off the telly, coming to Carlisle to talk about their new books. Now, you probably know, you may have read, Paula shot to fame with The Girl on the Train. Um, but what I love about Paula is her refusal to play it safe. She could have and was in fact advised by many people to write endless iterations of girls on forms of transport, but she doesn't do that. She pushes herself and her new book, A Slow Fire Burning, is exceptional. I've, been, I've read it twice now and absolutely recommend it just as a thing to read, but I think that the conversation we're going to have about it will be amazing. Uh, Ruth Jones, as I said, gained television as a gained television. She gained fame as a television star and a screenwriter, but she is also a successful novelist. And Us Three is her second novel. It is obviously a story about three girls. They become best friends when they're eight years old. And then it's about what happens to a long, relation, what, a long relationship over the course of decades, actually. And you know, as life buffets these women, how does that change the dynamic? I think she'll be tremendous. Um, Alex Clark is coming to do that event and she's, uh, she's a really gifted interviewer. So that should be tremendous. A really exciting get for me, and that's the technical term, a get, um, was um, Jennifer McCombie. Now she won this year's Jalak Prize and she'll be talking about her novel, The First Woman. Now this story mixes Ugandan folklore and modern feminism to talk about a young girl coming of age in 1970s Uganda. Um, and as well as the story of this young girl, it's the story of the country itself. And it has magic and tradition and legend and a riveting uh, central character. And I have to say, although it is set in Uganda in the 20th century, in a world very different from the one I grew up in, a lot of the attitudes and depictions of the expectations that society puts on women felt horribly familiar and resonant. So I think, again, that's gonna be an amazing conversation. The novel's been shortlisted for awards. It's, um, it was named 2020's Book of the Year by numerous newspapers um, and Oprah Magazine. Um, now, Jennifer lectures in creative writing at Manchester Metropolitan University. So she's Cumbria adjacent. Um, and in 2020, she was selected as one of the 100 most influential Africans by New African Magazine. We've got some memoirs to tell you about. Um, Arifa Akbar will be talking about her book, Consumed, which was very recently long listed for the prestigious Bailey Gifford Prize for nonfiction. Now I have had a chance to read this and my gosh, you're not gonna forget this book once you've heard about it. It's a story about grief, it's about the redemptive power of art, and it's about family secrets. So at the, the heart of it is the story of Aretha's older sister who fell ill with something that no doctor seemed able to diagnose. And it was only the day before she died that they realized she had a form of tuberculosis, which they could have treated had they figured it out much, much sooner. 
Um, it's also very much a story of a troubled family and dislocation. And it also speaks to my personal belief that no two children in any family have the same upbringing, despite having the same parent. We've got Dr. Pragya Agarwal joining us. Now she'll sit down with um, interviewer Chitra Ramaswamy, whose own book, Expecting, won the Saltire First Book of the Year prize a few years ago and was shortlisted for the Polari First Book Prize. And they're talking about Pragya's new book, Motherhood. Um, because as well as being an acclaimed author, Dr. Agarwal is a behavioral and data scientist. She's renowned for campaigning on behalf of racial and gender equality. Um, and she recognizes that through individual stories, we can reveal universal experiences. So motherhood contains her own story, but it also draws on scientific research and it presents an intersectional look at fertility choices, uh, taking in education, economics, feminism, race, and I think it's a very important book. I'm very excited that she's coming to talk to us about it um, and about the variety of the parenting experience. Um, so again, another not to be missed conversation. Um, we always have poetry. So Thursday night is the winner of the annual competition to celebrate with an open mic night at Cakes and Ale. And then the next morning, anyone who's not too hungover can come to the poetry breakfast at Tully hosted by Malcolm Carson. And in both cases, there are going to be opportunities to you know, stand up and share your work, hear what others have been working on. As far as workshops for poetry go, Susan Cartwright Smith, who is the Gosling Psych Writer in Residence with Cumbria Wildlife Trust, is going to lead a workshop, weather permitting, in the secret garden at Tully House um, about writing poetry inspired by nature. Uh, whether or not permitting, we'll just drag that indoors. Um, our other writing workshops include one for beginning and improving nonfiction writers. Um, there's going to be a session devoted to flash fiction, which is a very hot new genre, and a workshop <clears throat> led by Lancaster University um, professor of writing, Jen Ashworth. Uh, now in 2011, she was chosen by the BBC's Culture Show as one of their best new British novelists. And I have read her most recent novel, Ghosted, A Love Story, and oh my God, it's good. So now I've given you like a laundry list of things to take to your local bookshop and say, I want all these books. Her workshop is gonna be about developing a regular writing practice. So it's perfect for anybody who finds trouble making time for themselves and carving out you know, that 10 minutes, 15 minutes, anyone who finds a blank page overwhelming. Um, and it's based on her 100 Days of Writing Project, which she chronicled on Instagram. So then our grand finale for the weekend is a partnership with Carlisle One World Center. And this year it's with Samantha Walton, who will be interviewed about her new book called Everybody Needs Beauty. Now, Samantha is a poet and a reader in modern literature at Basketball University. She's also been a fellow at the Rachel Carson Center in Munich. Um, and her book really explores this phenomenon of nature cure where we're all told to go out and, you know, wild swim and forest bathe and get vitamin N, or as I should say, vitamin N after 24 years. Um, but she wants to, she's looking at whether or not A, these things really work, and also the effect this will have on disappearing ecosystems. Um, you know, how do we interact with nature in a way that benefits nature at the same time? And she's visited water, mountains, forests, gardens, farms, et cetera, and connects all these various cures with social and environmental justice, climate change, work, capitalism, and the global legacies of colonialism to ask how we can make the nature cure political. Finally, in our little satellite event, it's not even a little event, um, on the 10th of October, Robin Ince comes to town. Now, Robin, you may have heard of, he's a stand-up comic. He's co-creator and presenter of Radio 4's award-winning Infinite Monkey Cage with his mate, Brian Cock, Professor Brian Cock. He's also half of the Book Shambles podcast with Josie Long. He won Celebrity Mastermind, and he's just a general great person and a friend of mine. And his new book is called The Importance of Being Interested. 
And what it is, is a brilliant whistle stop tour through science in which he argues that we all need a healthy amount of scientific wonder in our lives, even if we don't understand what we're being amazed by. Um, and because of his work with Brian and touring the world and all this stuff, he has interviewed some of the most amazing scientific minds, astronauts, uh, neurophysicists, biologists, anyone you can think of, names that are absolute headliners. So I'm thinking that is going to be an amazing conversation as well. And now I will be quiet or I will Lee, answer questions. <laughs> Lee, thank you so much. I'm afraid we have no time for questions because that was such a delicious range of material. And I'm sure you're that's, going to get lots of responses. That's thank fine. You. Thank you so much. Um, a, a, a wonderful meeting. And thanks to everyone for their contributions. Uh, for Livy. Thank you to Livy. Thank you to Lee. Tiny headlines before we go. Please sign up. Free workshops available on writing skills. Um, that's available on the CACN website. Uh, and also, um, we've got our big quarterly meeting on the 8th of October around uh, environmental questions. Next week on the Zoom, we've got Joe Lappin and Mark Johnson from Cumbria Local Enterprise Partnership. Um, so a, a very different feel to next week's meeting, and I hope we'll see all of you there. Please remember to save the chat. Three little dots down the bottom, saving chat there, and I hope you all have great weekends. <laughs>